Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the 2017 Global Education Conference. What a fun day this has been. This is our eighth annual Global Education Conference, and um, we're so delighted that you're with us, and we're really thrilled to have Silvia Martinez here as our as a keynote speaker for the first day. Welcome, Sylvia. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Oh, what a delight. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters, especially Participate. We have uh, Cutter Foundation for the first time this year, Digital Promise taking it global. Uh, these, all of these organizations have been supportive and we really appreciate it. They help us take this shoestring event and magnify it. Okay, this is your chance to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map, you're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it twice. Then you're going to go over to the map and click generally where you're located. I saw in the chat Tunisia. Looks like New Zealand, North America, a couple Alaska. Wow, that's interesting. Australia. Cool. So very fun. Okay, keep that coming in the chat, but I'm going to move us forward to give Sylvia as much time as she needs. Sylvia, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Steve, and, and thank you for providing this opportunity for so many people. I know you and Lucy and your team of volunteers work so hard on this, and it's so important to be able to get together and talk and share about what's happening all over the world because I really I really see um, schools all over the world just just really wanting to make change and there's so many exciting things that that um, schools are doing it's it's fantastic to be able to share some of them with you in the last um, two or three years I've been all over the globe uh, Australia <laughs> in, in Africa, in Denmark, um, it's been an amazing, an amazing journey um, since I started talking about the maker movement. And that's going to be my topic today, is how this learning revolution, this global revolution, is showing up in schools around the world. So um, this is something that you may or may not know about. The maker movement is something that's happening right now. Um, all over the world. It's really a collective, um, kind of a global problem-solving collaborative. People are getting together in, in local communities and in informal online communities to share problems and solutions and help each other with all of that. It's, it's also connected to people wanting to take charge of their lives, to do it yourself, to reinvent and recycle. and um, it's a way of taking back agency as a person, as a member of a community, as a citizen of the world, and not waiting for someone else to solve your problems or a, a company to make a product. The, the, tools and, uh, the, the tools and technology of the maker movement are focused on people being able to make things and do things for themselves right now. So things like 3D printers um, allow you to prototype a design where, you know, you don't have to wait for a company to make a product. You can make these things yourself. And in the very near future, we're going to be sharing these designs worldwide and uh, even, even taking that power to the next level. So what I want to show some of you is some of the far out things that the make ha are happening in the maker movement and also what's happening today in real schools and how those are intimately connected. Um, if you've ever been to a maker fair, you know what I'm talking about. It's a place where people come together to show off, to do show and tell, um, to show people what they know and what they can do and what their questions are. You might find a car made out completely out of, of 3D printed pieces. You might find a family building at a Lego table. You might find a giant robot that someone's built. It's, it's fun. It's whimsical. It's um, just an expression of humanity. People love to make and do and share. And, you know, when I, I've been to a, a number of maker fairs all over the world, and people constantly ask me, why can't school be more like maker fair? And you know what? That's not a, a silly question. That's not trivial. Um, school can be 
more relevant, more fun, more whimsical. Not, you know, not just playtime all the time, but good things that support the kinds of science and technology and that and social contents and social justice and social studies and history and geography and writing, all the things we want kids to learn by putting it in a modern context where um, uh, students know that they're part of a community, this global community that's sharing problems and solutions. Um, it's one of the reasons we wrote the book Invent to Learn. So Gary Steger and I have been traveling the world after writing this book. In fact, um, Gary is right now in Doha giving a presentation about this same exact subject. People all over the world are thinking about how schools can change. And we didn't write the book to tell teachers what to do. We wrote it to reconnect teachers to good practices that we know work, problem-based learning, hands-on learning, connecting them to modern technology and um, offering a glimpse of how this could work in, in real classrooms. So just, you know, for reference, anything I talk about, the resources in the book are all on the inventtolearn.com website. Uh, please go visit the website. We have professional development. We will come and, and, and work in your school. Um, there's a lot of videos. There's a lot of resources. There's all of our shopping lists. Uh, of what we take to our workshops. There's all of our handouts that we give out at our workshops. So a lot of resources, blog posts, you name it. Um, and since we wrote the book, we've also published nine other books, most of them written by teachers who are doing this in their classrooms. So the Invent to Learn Guide for, for, to Making in the K-3 Classroom was written by Alice Baggett, an educator in the Seattle area, who's been um, working it throughout her school to, to help kids and, and help the teachers understand how these hands-on, minds-on experiences can enhance the mission of the school. Um, and I invite you to take a look at the cmkpress.com uh, website to look at all these books. And especially um, Meaningful Making, there's a book down here, Meaningful Making. I don't know if I can draw, draw a circle around that. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, here we go, sort of a yellow, <laughs> I'm not very good at this, yellow circle. Um, this book is from the Fab Learn Fellows out of the Stanford Graduate School of Education, which is a group of educators who have been chosen to try and disseminate their best practices. So this book is available for free online. If you follow the link at cmkpress.com, you can download these amazing articles and project ideas from all these, these uh, fa fabulous educators. And uh, we, uh, we are working on volume two of this book as we speak. So um, to, jump for, to jump right into this, when I talk to schools and educators, I don't talk about the maker movement in general. You know, sure it's fascinating. Sure there are businesses forming and, and it's, it, you know, it's a momentous time in history. But I want to talk to schools about what really works in the classroom. And some things, you know, not everything that's maker means it's perfect for, for school. Some things are too expensive. Some things are too dangerous. Some things are just toys. You know, we don't want to waste our times with things that are just once and done. So um, in the book, we focus on three areas that we call game changers, three, thing, three kind of big buckets of technology that we think really have the, the opportunity to change education. And that's computer controlled fabrication, physical computing, and programming. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those. So um, first of all, computer controlled fabrication. Now this is both additive, meaning 3D printing that build uh, materials into a, a finished product, and subtractive, like laser cutters that cut away like a sculptor takes material off of a block of uh, you know, stone. Um, these fabrication technologies are all computer controlled so that the, the designer, the artist, the engineer can input their designs into the computer and then these are transmitted to these machines. Now, this is changing industries all, of, all over the world. Um, on this slide, there's a picture of a, of a chocolate cake being 3D printed, um, a hydraulic machine being 3D printed. You're actually printing the different kinds of materials all at the same time. Uh, that's a shoe. There's going to be consumer goods very soon on the market that you will be able to scan your foot in and get your shoe made for you in the design and color you want instantly. Um, the medical uses are absolutely mind-blowing. Um, there's more to come. 
Um, they're making ears out of cow cartilage and they're 3D printing hearts and kidneys and lungs. Um, NASA is not only talking about 3D printing pizza for Mars astronauts, but 3D printing the robots that are going to roll out of the Mars lander and uh, make bigger robots to, to you know, colonize Mars. There's amazing things coming. And the, the message for schools is not that, oh, someday kids are going to have these great jobs, but they can have control of this technology today. Not because the 3D things are so amazing to print out. As you can imagine, it's not the plastic printed parts that are the important part. It's the process of design. It's using and understanding 3D mathematics in a way that is simply not possible or not that, you know, and, and not that interesting, frankly, on, with paper and pencil. Yet, here you can literally make something out of nothing using your imagination, math, and some powerful design tools. And these design tools are not hard. This is Tinkercad, which is completely um, accessible for younger kids. Um, you know, and kids all over the world are using these printers to make things, to make things in uh, low income areas where you don't have the opportunity to buy them. Yes, it's expensive to buy the 3D printer, but then you can design and build your own parts. Um, you know, so it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's definitely a trade-off. Um, you can get kids connected to social organizations. For example, Enabling the Future connects people with 3D printers with uh, people who need prosthetic devices. It's an absolutely fascinating way to connect kids with the opportunity to do good in the world. And this is good all over the world. There are literally people in the Sudan with 3D printers on the backs of their mopeds, 3D printing prosthetic arms for kids who've lost their hands in, in landmine accidents. And you can only imagine that this absolutely changes not only these young men's lives, but their families, their village, their community, everything changes. And connecting kids to what's happening in the real world, I think, is, is crucial. Um, now, you might not know this, but the word prosthetic doesn't, doesn't actually mean replacing what's broken. It means adding additional capability to, the, to, to humans. So if you've ever thought that one opposable thumb is a good idea, what about two? Well, someone's just invented that. And uh, if, we, if we had movies, you could see the second opposable thumb uh, uh, being used to play the guitar or squeeze a lemon. Um, and there are a, a number of amazing medical devices that are coming to enhance human capabilities, tattoos that can tell you if you've gotten a sunburn or provide insulin to your body or give, give uh, um, information to a, to a doctor. These, these, these technologies are, are coming down the pike really soon. Um, physical computing is, is my second game changer. Um, this is something that you probably know as robotics. You might even know it as wearable computing. We, some of us had Google Glasses. Um, you know, some of us have a Fitbit. That's wearable computing. The reason that these are possible now is these low-cost microprocessors that are getting smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper. Meaning that in the classroom, these are things that you can absolutely buy for very little money and give kids the ability to connect the physical world with the digital world. That's what physical computing means. You're controlling the physical world with, with computation. You're bringing data from the, from the uh, physical world into the computer with these devices. Um, Arduino is, is one that a lot of schools have started to experiment with. The Raspberry Pi is a very good one. The uh, BBC Microbit. And there are a number of other small devices that allow kids to experiment and control their world. Um, this dress that you see on this slide is a pollution sensing gown. This uses another microprocessor, microcontroller, sorry, a version of the Arduino called a lily pad to connect to sensors and lights that are in that dress. So this is something that, you know, you can imagine would possibly interest someone, you know, one kid might be interested in a robot, one kid might be interested in setting up a Minecraft server with a Raspberry Pi, someone else might be interested in making a dress that, you know, has computational capabilities. 
Um, the more on-ramps you can provide for kids, I think, the more interesting you make the world and the more interesting and, and relevant science becomes. Um, so if you think about it, these small microcontrollers can do almost anything. Uh, there's a magic eight ball up at the top right uh, corner of the slide. That's a jack-o-lantern, jack so it's just a fun, whimsical project for, you know, for a holiday. Um, the, you can't see the eyes lighting up, but the eyes do different things. They look around and stuff. Um, uh, right below the, the jack-o-lantern, there are some students who built a sign language reading glove. So there are bend sensors, there are other kinds of sensors in that glove that's feeding the data back to the computer that's then interpreting and speaking. Um, you can see, you know, I don't know how exactly how old these students are, but they could easily be in high school. These things are well within the capability of middle school and high school students, and, some, and with some of the kits that are on the market, even younger. Um, on the bottom left, those are ballet slippers that track dance movements. So that small purple microcontroller that's sewn in is called the lily pad. And honestly, it's almost exactly the same functionally as that blue square um, microcontroller that's, that's right above it on that Magic 8 ball toy. So why have two different kinds? Well, the purple round lily pad is meant for sewables. So it's round because all of those white things are sewable pads where you can sew conductive thread. So the thread acts as the wires of the circuit that, that go through the, the slipper down to the sensors on the bottom of the, of, the, of the shoe. Now, that doesn't mean that there's controllers for boys and controllers for girls. In fact, there could be boys who are interested in sewing. Sewing's a cool thing. You can make three-dimensional stuff that you can use. Um, and girls are certainly interested in robots. It just provides more on-ramps with exactly the same design process behind them. So each of these projects, as different as they are, use the same design process where you're thinking about what you want to make, you make it, you try it out, you troubleshoot because it never works the first time, you learn more, you try more, you make it better, and eventually you come up with something that works. And the thrill of making things work translates across all of these experiences. This is really important for kids to have this experience where they are in control of these objects. And there's a number of them that are perfect for schools. Um, so programming is my third grade game changer. It's sort of a, a, of, a, of a cheat because it's actually in the other two, but it's that important to me. Um, I think programming is the Rosetta Stone for really, under, for really understanding the potential of the maker movement. That things that are programmable give kids the capability of doing almost everything. Now, we've all heard there's like, you know, um, Hour of Code and there's a global call for programming. That's obviously not enough. We have to give kids experiences where they can have deep, long-term um, opportunities to build things both on the computer and connected to the real world that they want to. I happen to like um, languages, and there are thousands of languages. There's a language for everything you could imagine, for every age and grade you could imagine. I happen to like languages that were built for learning. If you're in school, I think uh, you owe it to yourself to take a look at the logo family of languages, which are actually very diverse nowadays. Um, since the 1980s when Seymour Papert and Cynthia Solomon and others invented the logo programming language as a way to teach programming and to teach mathematics to, to young people, um, it has branched off into daughters and sons and granddaughters and cousins of what, of what Scratch is one. It's probably one of the more well-known ones today. It's free from MIT. Scratch is block-based, uh, but still cr carries the same seeds of the, 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 the programmer being very close to what's happening on the screen and being able to make things happen without understanding a lot of arcane syntax. Um, and the cool thing about Scratch is that it's been shared now. You can see that screen. I just took that screenshot the other night. 26 million projects are archived on the Scratch, on the Scratch website. That's an amazing community of practice. Um, and Scratch is starting to come into the maker movement in full force. There are a lot of kits and projects from 
Lego we do to um, Raspberry Pi robots and the Arduino that uh, a Hummingbird robotics kit that connect to Scratch and allow you to plug sensors directly into your computer so that you can just take a, a, a block that says read, a, read the sensor and make a beating heart program almost instantaneously. Um, now, you may have noticed that all of the things I talked about use computers. Do I think that only technology counts? Only technology is, is, is important to, in the classroom? No. I'm saying that this is something you can use to expand your toolkit. It would be silly for me to say sewing is old and boring, but sewing with LEDs is fantastic. No. We're talking about kids having experiences with all kinds of, of materials and technology that they can dig into and make their own. I think, though, that these tools provide some special advantages. And Seymour Papert, who I mentioned invented the logo programming language, said this. If you can use technology to make things, you can make a lot more interesting things. And you can learn a lot more by making them. Now, I'm going to be completely presumptuous and add on to Seymour Papert and say, not only can the students learn about a lot more by making them, but the teachers can learn a lot more by watching students making interesting things. You, as, a as an educator, can watch a student and learn a lot more than watching them take a multiple choice test. You watch them make a robot, you're watching them succeed. You're, you're understanding how they, how they jump over hurdles, how they challenge themselves, how they help others, how they, they work to a goal. Um, all of these things inform you as an educator and, and allow you to do a better job in understanding how that child learns and helping them stretch for new goals. You know, and I, I am certainly not saying that we should throw away all, all our old stuff. In fact, there's some materials that are absolutely fantastic, like cardboard, right? Cardboard, practically free, easy to get, recyclable, um, easy to manipulate. But why not make a cardboard robot? Um, this robot, um, if, if you've seen me do my, my live keynotes, the video shows the, the, the cardboard robot barking and the eyes blink and it drives around. Um, this is something you can make with a Hummingbird's robotics kit, which is based on our, on our Arduino. Um, because why not take things that work, like making puppets and doing a puppet show or making animals and talking about, you know, the biological facts about anim animals, why not make them interactive? Why not make their eyes light up? And you're going to learn about electronics and programming and all of that along the way. Um, there's new conductive materials coming. Conductive dough, conductive thread, copper tape, foil, conductive ink. The girls in this picture have designed their own piano and painted the keyboard out of conductive paint. Um, this, isn't, uh, this isn't expensive, but it gives kids a, a real handle on some new kind of technology that, that's important in the world. Um, you can make fun things with, with soft circuitry. Paper electronics are terrific. Um, there's a lot of resources on my site directing you on, on how to build these kinds of projects. Um, and that leads me to the topic of STEAM. Now, STEAM is another thing that's flown around the world. Science, technology, engineering, and math, everyone says that's very important. But what about art? Why are we leaving art on the table? Um, I think that you can have projects that really do integrate those things. And I do think that arts are important, but not in a let's decorate the science project kind of way. Now, I'm going to show you a project that I think really illustrates this, this principle. Um, so this is a, uh, a, screen, a, a picture of a, of a computer using a program called Turtle Art. Now, Turtle Art is another granddaughter of Logo. It's, it's very similar to Scratch, but it focuses very strongly on two-dimensional geometric art. Um, the, this is actually a world culture unit in grade four. The students learn about Islamic tiling patterns. They learn about the rules of Islamic tiling patterns. And then they make their own using turtle art. Well, a couple of years ago, that's where this project would have stopped. You could have printed out the pictures or put them up on the wall or made a PowerPoint. But instead, Josh Berker, who, by the way, documented this project in his book, The Invent to Learn Guide to Fun, um, went further. 
So he exported that terminal art pattern into Tinkercad and extruded it. So he grew it into the third dimension. Now, what have you got? You've got a real thing instead of just a picture. What can you do? Well, you can print it out. What can you do with that? Well, you can make, you know, potato prints. You can use it for stamps. If you use it for stamps on firing clay, as his class did, um, the, the students painted these themselves and then have, have a classroom set of, um, of tiles. Now, what this says is different than, oh, uh, we know there's a lot of math in art. You could not have created these tiles without math, without understanding some of the mathematical principles behind them. This is something that's beautiful, that you can show parents to, to talk about that. And I really believe it illustrates this principle. To me, art is the verb. It's, and design is the process. Art isn't a thing you study. Art is what you do. And I think that the maker movement also understands that fact. The do is, what it, is what's important. We can study all we like about things, but when we do them, we start to really understand them. And the goal for schools is to get to the do as quickly as possible. So if you think I'm only talking about, about science and math, I'm not. Here's a project from a, a teacher, an eighth grade history teacher named Heather Pang in a school in California. She has her students design a monument. This is a culminating project at the end of the year. The students pick a person they've studied and they make a monument about them. Now, this is, they're in a school that's had a makerspace before the word makerspace existed. So this isn't like the year one project you start out with. And the students at the school know how to use the makerspace. They understand how to use this equipment. So she's not spending time in history class teaching how to use the laser cutter. And she's also not saying that, that laser cutting a monument teaches kids history. What Heather says is that um, the students' conversations about how to create a monument are rich. That the questions they ask are richer because they have to grapple with questions that real historians grapple with. How do I express what I know about this person to, a, to someone else? Um, that's the real job of being a historian. And any time we can put students in the position of being a real historian, mathematician, being a real scientist, being a real engineer, rather than learning about, I think we're really starting to get closer to what the maker movement could mean in schools. Now, there's all sorts of new things, exciting things going on in the maker movement. Um, the global health and education initiatives are absolutely fantastic. This is a, was a foldoscope project where this piece of origami essentially could be folded into a microscope and with a small $3 glass ball lens, you could do experiments. And then they crowdsourced thousands and thousands of experiments using this microscope from all over the world. And right now they're raising money to, to, to go from the 10,000 microscope project to the million microscope project. Um, you know, Nicholas Negroponte, who's predicted pretty much everything that's happened in the last uh, 20 years, says that bio is the new digital. There are, there are ways to program cells in, in what's called synthetic biology. So this is a challenge to schools who haven't changed their biology or their science curriculum in a number of years. The world is not waiting. Um, this is, for example, a website where high school teens are are, are being challenged to create projects on synthetic biology. And that banner ad down at the bottom, yes, you can mail away for free DNA. Is your school keeping up with these things? So brings us back around to the, to the, to the important question, why we're all here. Um, can we do this in schools? The schools say they want to change, but are we really ready for change? Um, I think we are, but it doesn't make it any easier. We still have to work hard at this. We still have to think carefully and continue to push forward to question what's working and weed out what's not working. Um, you know, sometimes people get the, the speech about the maker movement and they're just like, ah, you just said a bunch of words and I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, the words aren't important. It's not important to buy all the stuff, right? You can do this in a very low cost way. And in fact, the way to pick the right technology for you to use is not to think about the technology, but to think about learning. So when I look, when I evaluate new products, 
I think about, does this fit into the way that I think people learn? And the way I think people learn is by doing. That learning occurs when a new experience makes connections to existing knowledge. That we can't deliver learning to the, to the, to the student, to the human, to the brain. And that the best way to ensure understanding inside your head is through active construction of shareable things outside your head. Now, I didn't make this up. I, I steal from the best. Um, the, the first two, you, if you've been to education school, you might re recognize as, as the Piagetian idea that knowledge is a consequence of experience. That no matter what you tell someone, they're only hearing it through their own lens, kind of mixing up eyes and ears, but they're connecting it to their pre-existing experiences. And it turns, it's, it's a different thing than when it, when it came out of your mouth. So I think as, you know, we have to constantly remember that knowledge is being constructed personally and individually inside the head of every learner. And the third one is Seymour Papert, again, um, it, 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 the idea that this kind of learning happens best when it's connected to making real things. Now, it doesn't have to be a concrete thing. The thing could be a poem or a, um, a computer program or a robot or, you know, uh, something else. Um, but ha make, making sure that it's meaningful to the person who's making it and sharing it with other people who think it's meaningful as well creates the conditions where, where knowledge can really flourish. Um, and what happens when people don't think about learning and they just buy technology are headlines like this. Why is Hoboken throwing away all its student laptops? Sorry to pick on Hoboken. It's a city in New Jersey. Um, but it's an illustration of what happens when you just go shopping. What happened? Well, they bought a bunch of stuff. They probably had a nice chart of battery life and specs, and everyone had very serious conversations about what the best laptop would be. But I guarantee you, they didn't do enough work talking about what was going to happen in the classrooms, what was going to change, what the new expectations were, and why they were buying these laptops. What I worry is, is that all the talk about the maker movement, the headline in three or four years is going to be, uh, why is Hoboken throwing away all the 3D printers? Because 3D printers didn't change education. Well, I guarantee you, 3D printers will not change education. It's what you do with this technology, with the emphasis on the do, meaning the students. It's what the students do with technology and how much agency over they, ha they have over it and how rich the technology is for creating those kinds of experiences. Here's Seymour Papert again. He's got the answers to everything. What he said was that the role of the teacher is to create the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. So when you kind of start to think about well, what does a makerspace look like, if you think about it as an invention factory, it puts a whole new light on what to buy, how to set it up. And we don't have time today to go through all the list of the things that you should think about. But um, in short, what you're looking for are low floor and high ceiling. And that's true for uh, technology, what you buy. It's true for the space you create. It's true for the experiences you have. You want uh, students to be able to get right into um, ex relevant and, and exciting experiences and then be able to iterate on them, to be able to add more, to be able to, to improve them, to go farther, to go deeper into their understanding of what the materials can do. How can I push this robot? robotics kit to do something more. Now remember that robotics dog I showed you a few slides ago. Here it is again. But with this same hummingbird kit, you can do lots of other things. Besides there being, besides being able to program the hummingbird robotics kit in Scratch, there's about nine other programming languages you can use. Um, these are projects created with that same kit, genetic simulation, um, making waves with a gear motor, building a robot that finds north, uh, representing gas pressure and, and graphing gas pressure. All of these using the same kit of materials. So it's not important to say buy seven kits that are each going to teach one thing. It's important to give kids the ability to understand and be intimately and deeply um, 
uh, appreciative of the materials they're working with. It's also important to give kids time. You know, I say it's a design process, but what it really means is time. Kids need time to work with things and not just be hurried on to the next to the next step. You know, in a lot of schools, we give kids a lot of props and scaffolding because we know we don't have time to let them do these things. So we give them mind maps, we give them storyboards, we give them you know, flow charting templates and say, okay, if you're writing a really complicated thing, you would need this, but I'm going to teach it to you anyway. And they don't even know what you're talking about. And then the project becomes, what's the teacher want me to write in the bubbles instead of how can I make this program work? So the more experience with really rich tools they have and the more time, and I know that's a precious commodity, uh, the deeper the students can, can get into this. And that informs the next cycles of learning. You know, craftsmanship isn't just about having good tools or knowing what to do. Craftsmanship is also about love, about loving your materials, loving your tools, finding the unexpected in them. Um, you know, I, in, in a lot of cases, we don't allow students to really fall in love with the things they're doing. And then we get upset with them when they're not invested. Uh, and we blame them for having ADHD. And it, it's not their fault. It's our fault for not looking at this as a craftsmanship, as mindfulness with interesting materials. Um, I think Maria Montessori had it totally right. She said, never help a child with a task at which he feels he can succeed. She, what she's saying is, let students do what they can do. Not let them fail. Not let them bang their heads against the wall. But give them enough chance to try something. And you know what? You may even be surprised. Um, this is a very rich part, I think, of what the maker movement can bring to classrooms because mistakes aren't expensive when you're using you know, inexpensive materials or doing a simulation online. You don't have to worry about doing something wrong because you can immediately do it again. This freedom. Uh, really does promote a lot of, of the design sensibility that, that we're talking about. Uh, there's also a lot of research that says that the maker movement provides multiple points of entry for girls. And, and not just girls, but other non-traditional science, uh, science students. That girls find it interesting to do good in the world. They don't find it interesting to make a robot work. They find it interesting to make a robot that can help someone who's a quadriplegic or their aunt who needs help picking up a coffee cup, or their younger sister. Um, but the, the way we teach science sort of subverts the social good until way too late in the process when, when the maker movement tool can really put that front and center. Um, we're also looking at spaces. A lot of people are talking about um, how to make maker spaces. And I think that low floor, high ceiling applies there too. You want spaces that, in, that, that have an invitation aspect to them, that are an invention factory, that allow for serendipity and flexibility, where you can have a quiet space or a space where you can record a video. And it's under control of the people who are, are using the space. Um, now, any space can be a maker space. I firmly believe this. I don't think you have to have a special place. I don't think you need to spend a million dollars. I don't think you need to spend a lot of technology. This is a classroom with a lot of stuff packed into it. Every classroom should be a place where students can go get materials to make and explore and make sense of the world. Um, you, can all, you can build a maker space. Look, if you've got the money, do it. Um, libraries are terrific. A lot of libraries are, are incorporating maker spaces into what they do. I think it's very relevant. Libraries already have a lot of advantages. They're not set up to be graded. They're cross-curricular. Uh, librarians are the ultimate connectors in a lot of schools. Uh, people are repurposing computer labs or studios or art rooms or, or media rooms. All of those can be maker spaces. So, I mean it when I say it's not, it's not about the money. But I think if you're claiming that you're, you're, you're incorporating making into your school because you're changing the world, you want big changes and you're trying to show how different education can be, you have to show that you mean it. 
And the bigger your shift, the bigger your visible commitment needs to be. Your makerspace on a budget may not be sending the, that, that message. And it's just a fact of life. It's not that I don't love people being, um, you know, thrifty and, and inventive, but the claim that we're changing education, I think, needs to be, needs to have, put your money where your mouth is. Um, you can also tap into a global network of people who are, who are asking the same questions, doing the same things, wondering about the same issues as you are. Um, there's Twitter, it's fantastic. There's a lot of resources on Invent to Learn. Peggy's been helpfully tweeting out just a whole lot of stuff. Um, there's a Google group at uh, the, the, the URL is k12makers.com. There's a thousand educators who all are very friendly and helpful, will answer any question, and, and searching through the archives, you might find they've already answered your question. Um, the, the, the Meaningful Making book is from the Stanford FabLearn Fellows. There are more blogs and resources on fablearn.org. And Harvard's Agency by Design, which is part of Project Zero, Howard Gardner's Project Zero, has also just released a book called Maker-Centered Education, which has a ton of facts and resources. And don't forget your students, your parents, and your community. Some of your students may be doing this already. I have lots of kids walk up to me who know an amazing amount about Arduinos or Raspberry Pis but have never taken that to school because they don't think anybody would care. Um, parents who can sew and uh, have lathes and can provide great ideas about building fun stuff. And your community may have a makerspace in it. Your community college, um, a university, or a community makerspace. There's also research that you can use. Don't feel like this is just hand-waving. Um, in fact, the, the Stanford University and the Lehman Center in Brazil did a research study about which practices uh, really improve student achievement. And they're all the ones you'd expect, hands-on activities, relevant experiences, uh, real-world project, to really focusing on, on helping the students learn how to learn. But number one, active learning practices. Trumped every other variable, including the student's background, and prior achievement. These, there's research, and, and again, Peggy's been tweeting out links, there's research that shows that kids who do understand more than kids who are just fed facts. Um, so, if there's one thing I can leave you with today, it's that I don't think that this making in education is about the shopping. It's not a shopping list and it's not a special place or a special room, it's a stance towards the learning that gives kids the confidence and the capability to take advantage of this amazing time in history to make sense of the world and to take charge of the world. Um, you know, I invite you to join us. Um, Gary and I, since writing the book, have traveled the world talking to teachers in schools about this. There are schools around the world who are taking this charge and running with it, doing amazing things. A little bit of research will help you find these, these amazing individuals in schools and get good ideas and try it for yourself. Try it. You'll like it. You have to give it a try. That's part of the maker movement too. Um, if you'd like to learn more about our workshops, there is a workshop uh, page on the inventtolearn.com website. We also have a website called cmkfutures.com. Um, one of the things that we do every summer is have a four-day summer institute where teachers learn how to create these experiences in their classroom. Not by us lecturing at them. No, we walk the talk of the experience coming first. So most of the time at Constructing Modern Knowledge, our summer institute, is spent with teachers deeply involved with projects that, that push beyond all of their expectations. And every year, teachers tell me that it changes the way that they view um, how they're going to run their classroom, that they're going to make it more experiential. Um, you know, there are, there are so many stories that, that I could share from Constructing Modern Knowledge. I want to give you guys time to, to ask questions, but um, I just want to share this one story. Um, a couple years ago, 
my teacher came up to me at the end of, of CMK and said, um, I had th you know, thank me. I had an absolutely fantastic time. I learned so much. And everything in my classroom is going to change. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a bold statement. Um, do you mean like, you know, you're going to do wearable technology because she made this fantastic wearable technology project? And she said, well, yes, but that's not exactly what I meant. And she said, I'm going to tell you my story of what I'm taking away from CMK. She said, the first day, um, we brainstormed and we, uh, and our group got together and we had this fantastic idea and I was so excited, but then we talked and 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 I, and I really was pretty sure this wasn't going to go anywhere and I wasn't sure I liked the idea. I wasn't so sure I liked these people anymore and I just had to get up and I got up and I went outside, had a cup of coffee, took a walk in the park, two deep breaths, looked at the beautiful sky. And as I'm coming back into the, into the, uh, we have it in a hotel, so I'm walking back into the conference room. My team found me and said, where have you been? We figured it out. And they grabbed me and they told me they missed me. And, and sure enough, they figured something, we had a breakthrough and this is exactly what I wanted to do. And I blinked my eyes and four days later, we'd done something I never expected to do. And she said, here's what happened last night. Last night, I sat up in bed, full upright in bed out of a deep sleep, and I thought, what happens to my kids when they need a cup of coffee? Because right now, when my kids get off task, I run up behind them and say, get back to work, get back to work. And if somebody had walked up to me as I was walking out of the, of, of the conference room and tapped me on the shoulder and said, get back to work, I would have gone upstairs and packed my bags and gone home. She said, everything in my classroom is going to change. That means more to me than the technology. It means more to me than, the, than her learning to use, a, you know, a, a lily pad Arduino. That realization is, is so important that teachers create the learning conditions for students. And they have a tremendous amount of, of leeway about how, how these learning spaces are, are created, designed, and developed in Rome. And um, I hope that people who come to CMK see that it can be done without lecturing kids on, on new technology, that just doing it really does work. So I also invite you, if you're interested in any of these things, please sign up for our free newsletter. Uh, all you need to do is send a, um, an email to, to friend at inventalearn.com. You'll automatically be added to our email list. Don't worry, we don't spam you. We're not that ambitious. But you'll, you'll find out about new books and events and resources and, and, and you know, free things. So um, I invite you guys to make it happen in, in real schools. Um, I'm going to take some questions. I'll, I'll look a little bit. I don't know, Steve, are you here? If you want, if you have any questions that you've noticed, I really haven't been watching the chat. It's been going by so fast. So, um, if you have questions that you've seen go by, feel free to throw them out. I did not, but if you had a question and you put it in the chat and it hasn't gotten answered, go ahead and post it again, or you can raise your virtual hand. Touch the hand icon in the participant box and we'll give you the microphone and you can ask a question. I have the and microphone, so I'll take it and run. <laughs> nice. Um, um, so, Sylvia, I, I was in and out um, helping people but I caught a lot of this, and you and I have talked quite a bit about things over the years. And interestingly, my son Henry, who's uh, Gary's new best friend, um, is a freshman in high school. And in his junior high, there was limited experiences with this kind of stuff. There was no official maker space. They had a STEM class in addition to regular science class for maybe six weeks every year. Um, and so now he has a buddy who's kind of into different things and there's some sort of geek device class after or, or club after school I don't know what it's called um, once a week and he hangs out with his friend Richard who's into things and the teacher seems to give them a box of Arduinos and let them go or just you know there, there's no there's no um, and Henry's like I don't know what to do I've never seen these things before right. the teacher's not giving me any help and 
so I guess the question for you is, is he's, it, it's disappointing to me that he, I think if he'd had more of a background in this in earlier years, it wouldn't be such a mystery to him and he would just play with this stuff and he would figure it out, right? But, you no. know, I guess my larger question is, they have Project Lead the Way at the school. He's not in that yet. Um, but, like, what do high schools do where there's such limited time and resources to get kids making, and, and teachers are just worried about um, covering the content and doing what they normally do. How, do you, how do they go about all this? What are the most creative ways that you've seen with high schools to accommodate a maker mindset? Um, well, you know, I think it's, so let me comment back on your son's experience. Um, I think it's absolutely the wrong way to go to just put a lot of stuff out and say, okay, kids, discover it. I, I, th I think that's just that's just a misunderstanding of you know giving kids agency and choice. Um, you know, in, in the in Invent to Learn, there's a couple of chapters on creating good projects and talking about prompts and challenges. Prompts that that give kids ideas, but let them fill in the blanks. Um, you know, like building robots that climb ramps or building robots that, that go to a certain distance or making, you know, there's all kinds of prompts that you can imagine the materials you have um, being, you know, you can use the materials you have to, to, to solve those prompts, but you don't t say exactly how to do it. Um, so I think that there's a definite missed opportunity there. Um, the, the, the where does it fit in the curriculum question is much harder. Um, a lot of, of places, you know, a lot of kids who, are, who have a college-focused, uh, you know, set of, set of classes have no room for other stuff. Um, this, is, this is a problem. Um, we can't just be content to have this only be in clubs because that, that limits the opportunities. It kind of defines who gets to participate in, the, in those opportunities. I also think we're we're denying college-bound kids the opportunity to really do things. We're, 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 you know, labeling success as only passing tests and, you know, racking up AP classes. That's, you know, it, 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 it's tough and we have to figure it out. There are a lot of schools that are redoing the science. They're, they're carving time out of science class and out of math class to do more hands-on activities. What it really takes is collaboration between these departments. Um, yes, if you're a, a, an intrepid teacher who's going to buck the system and go it on alone, um, you know, God bless you. But the, when a school is really serious, they have to give the teachers time to reconfigure the curriculum where these hands-on on activities happen in, in class. That means making room in a curriculum that's already overcrowded. It's, it's, a, it's a tough and, and very difficult situation. Now, that said, people are doing it. I, I go to schools all the time and they said, we scrapped our, you know, ninth grade intro to science class and we remade it into a, you know, engineering challenge class. It, you know, and the school down the road is like, ooh, we couldn't possibly do that. So I think that, that there, are, there are lots of obstacles but focusing on the, the outcome of having, school, having kids have more uh, design-oriented experiences and hands-on hands -on experiences um, and trying to, to pull stuff out of the curriculum that just isn't relevant anymore um, is, is key. Teachers have to have time to think about their own curriculum. This can't be just a book you buy and you, you're reading the, you know, page 19 for day 19. Um, it happens with, with a dedicated community thinking about how school can be different. Excellent answer. I, I approve. That was great. Um, yeah, I think also, too, I would like to see the school use it. Um, you can probably hear Henry yelling in the background right now. Um, you can, I, I, in formal time, I'd like to see them used differently. Like, I'd like, I would love to see something really creative and experimental in the summer when kids particularly teenagers are looking for something to do. Um, I mean, I think there are ways if you really wanted to think outside the box, you could do something. So anyway, thank you. I appreciate that answer. Sure. You know, I, I think there's a lot of examples of people doing it, and, and schools are, you know,
big institutions, they don't change easily. Um, but, you know, it has to be done. It's like one of those impossible things that we have to try and do anyway. And eventually, um, it, it's all, it's all going to happen. Um, we, we cannot continue. I mean, you've seen the statistics of the chart of um, kids think school is relevant, right? And it, and it, like, goes down, 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 down. Every year, it goes, it gets worse and worse. We're, we're, you know, working ourselves out of a job. Um, schools are just going to disappear if people realize they can, you know, get what they need from the world in, in other places. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural institution that it's going to change, it, you know, it will change in response to pressure from parents and, and teachers and, you know, the world. Other questions? This might actually be a good place to finish, so people will have a break for the top of the hour. Is that okay? Absolutely fine. I saw some amazing resources being shared in the in the chat room, so that's that's just fantastic. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm clapping for Sylvia. I hover over the smiley face and I go down to the applause I'm button. Clapping for you. Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> I'm going to click off the recording. Thank you, everybody. Hope you have fun the rest of the conference. Hang on, Sylvia. I want to talk to you for just two seconds. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys. If you want to.